Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to this morning's uh, audit committee. Um, I thank you all for attending. Um, first of all, are there any apologies and substitutions? Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, a, um, a substituting for uh, Mike Williamson, who's apologies today. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, and are there any uh, declarations of interest in respect of any of the items on the agenda today? No? Okay, good stuff. Um, okay, moving on swiftly to the minutes of the last audit committee on the 22nd of May. Uh, are there any comments as to accuracy, first of all, of, 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 of these minutes? Uh, and then I'll ask if there are any um, comments. If, are we happy with the accuracy of the minutes? Thank you. Uh, are there any comments on the minutes? Councillor Donaldson. Yes. Um, uh, it's just one thing we want to clarify, and it's at the very end of the minutes. It's on page 12 under section 279. And there was discussion at the last audit committee about the question with the uh, loans fund and the difference of opinion at that time with Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission and it was um, in fact the way I read it at the time was there was actually the potential for financial detriment to the council of three to four million um, and that potentially on a recurring basis hence what I'd like to ask and I think it's such an important issue uh, what progress has been made on this and could I ask a head of finance and also a head of legal on this just to explain the position. Thank you. Um, thank you Vice Convener. I'm pleased to report that Audit Scotland took their own independent advice from RQC. I'm pleased to say that they agreed with our advice so the loans fund regulation issue is no longer an issue. There will be no comment made on the accounts. There is no question of any material um, detriment at all. We were right. I know it was, um, I hope uh, some council doesn't mind me saying, for it was a small technicality last time. It was certainly a technicality, but it was something that had me uh, very concerned indeed. But at the end of the day, it seems to have been, in some respects, even though it's gone to uh, council, the legal council, uh, it's been a bit of a fuss about nothing. But I think there are things just to seek a reassurance that this is something, it just won't recur now. It's, it's done and dusted. There's absolutely no question about it. There's no limitation about what you can do, provided that you um, make your loan adjustments and you're acting prudently. There's, there's no issue at all now. There will not be an issue for us going forward at all. Thank you. Stuart, you want to come in? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Dawson, just, just to, to add to what the Head of Legal and Governance has said, um, Audit Scotland have issued uh, revised guidance in a, sub a supplementary technical bulletin, technical bulletin 2, just to clarify the points, and as Lisa has already said, there is no issue. Okay, uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener, and um, like Councillor Donaldson, I'm relieved. Um, it might have been a technical issue, but it would have been one that had fairly major financial consequences. And I think there was also a point in principle about it. Um, and I'm pleased that the head of legal governance is pleased and we've won. Um, my, my questions are twofold. Uh, at the very beginning of the minute, um, when I raised the point about uh, advice about climate change, could we ask, I could ask if there's a, an update on that, please. And um, I've also got another question further on. Thank you, Fraser. Thank you. Yes, I've um, been in touch with Peter Marshall and a uh, uh, members training session being arranged for early September. That's great. Much, much appreciated. Thank you. And on page nine of the minute, there, there was a, a lengthy discussion on universal credit. Um, uh, but at the end of it, a presentation was agreed to be given to a future meeting. Um, have, we, have we got a date for, for that. Yeah, if I can just come in on that and just say that um, uh, Lynn Brady, who, who attended the, 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 the last meeting, uh, has been in touch with uh, COSLA uh, and uh, there is more information going to be forthcoming uh, uh, through that source uh, on this issue 
uh, and so therefore it was agreed to uh, defer uh, the session until September, by which time we will have a lot more information to consider. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe some of these questions has already been um, done, but because I've just came on, um, maybe for clarity. Um, Alios and Horsecross, is there any update on a Horsecross recovery plan? Um, yeah, I think, I think we'll come on to that as one of the material items on the agenda, if that's okay, Councillor Anderson. Okay, and secondly, um, uh, again, we're going back to page eight and uh, the, the issue of universal credit. Um, what other form would there be for considering, for, for uh, discussing and debating a universal credit if it wasn't at audit? Uh, because, it, you know, considering there could be a reputational uh, risk attached to this if the implementation of universal credit went wrong, is there another uh, forum that could be used? Sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding your, your question. Councillor Anderson, can you elaborate? Well, it was said here that it was felt that the audit committee was not best placed to discuss the benefits system. Um, my question is, is there another forum then in, in the council that could discuss it? Because, as I say, there could be a risk of um, reputational risk if uh, implementation of universal credits went drastically wrong. Okay, understood. Thank you. I can ask Mrs. Simpson to uh, respond to that. I, I think the issue that that was picked up in terms of it, it, it wasn't really the locus for the audit committee to debate the pros and cons of national policy or national legislation. The purpose of it, the internal audit is to check that our into, internal control systems for the application of national policy and legislation are robust. And I think that's the distinction. I think it's probably just the way that it's been minuted. But this is not a policy setting um, committee. And if there was a debate, obviously there are various national fora where um, uh, welfare reform is, is discussed, but if it was a policy statement or a policy issue, that would be a matter for full council. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. If there are no further questions, um, uh, we'll uh, agree these minutes. Oh, Councillor Anderson. Oh, sorry. Okay. sorry. Councillor Donaldson. That's, That's the one, thank you. <laughs> I don't know who will be more. Just very quickly, can I say on the universal credit system, clearly it's not for us to discuss specific um, uh, payments, specific benefits. I think what it is our role is to look at controls and processes and under reputational risk, what really matters, certainly for often the most vulnerable in, in society, people you know, who have difficulties at times, uh, is that we can deliver, in terms of reputational risk, that we can deliver that in as, as decent and as civilised and humane a manner as possible and as efficient manner. What I do want to ask specifically is, and I did write to Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, and this is about the issue of um, uh, appeals tribunal hearings being not being held in Perth, I did hear back, I, I've circulated to all members of the Audit Committee. Um, I won't read out the full response from Sandra Martin, who is the Senior Operations Manager, clearly in Scotland, but she has stated, there are no plans currently to introduce a Perth hearing venue, and I, appreci I appreciate that this may be a disappointing response. We do, however, keep the HMCTS estate strategy under constant review, and the points you raise have been noted. I think it's something we want to you know, look at again. I think it's worth pointing out that Perth is the only city in Scotland, the only city that does not act as a venue for those hearings uh, and appeals. And I think that's uh, it's an issue. Uh, in various ways we can proceed with further. So it's just to make that point. But I have written and you've got the response. Uh, thank you, Councillor Donaldson, and thanks uh, very much for your, your work on this aspect, which was a concern to, I think, the whole committee 
uh, when it was last uh, raised. As I say, we will be uh, returning to this subject in September, uh, and uh, you know we can discuss uh, the, um, uh, the 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 overall situation around universal credit and 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 how this local authority deals with it uh, at that time. However, what I would say in in support of uh, your efforts and uh, the disappointment at, at the response is uh, that you know the, the there are as you say um, uh, hearing venues in Kirkcaldy, Dundee, uh, Dunfermline, and Stirling, uh, and uh, you know <laughs> there's a, there's a big city in the middle of all that called Perth, uh, which is 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 is, is not uh, um, similarly treated, and it is something that is a concern. And I think we should return to that. Could I just also say I've not as yet. Uh, I've sent this round to all the members of the audit committee, first of all, but uh, it's certainly, I'm happy if, if committees agreed, I'm sure, is to put it in the public domain, so I'll, I'll send to, to journalists what the response was. But I think it's something we do uh, want to pursue. I think there is potential yet on this, and there's a strong case for Perth as a venue. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that. Okay, if there are no further questions, oh, there, there are. Councillor Wilson. Well, it's just to, just to follow on from. Uh, first of all, I think we thank Councillor Donaldson for his initiative in doing this. Um, I think it's really important. It's a crazy decision, and it sounds as if the the, the letter was from a, a if I can say an an official of the of the government um, rather than uh, at any any higher level, any political level, and it sounds to me as if. It's the computer says no, you know, we don't do it at the moment and we're not doing it in the future type of approach. Um, it refers to an estates review, but I think, I don't know what the detail of, of Councillor Donaldson's letter was, but I think we, we, we did imply at the last meeting that if there was an opportunity, we would help facilitate um, um, accommodation if that, were, if that were something that was a problem, right? Um, and so... I think the, the reply is particularly disappointing and um, I thoroughly commend the Vice Convener's initiative on the matter and if he wants to publicise it and involve our parliamentary colleagues, I was going to suggest writing to the appropriate minister, um, but given where we are with uh, the Westminster situation, I'm not terribly sure if, we, uh, if, if anybody will be in office very long, so it might, it might be better to, to, to wait for, to a degree. So I, I, I really think this is something that we, we should be pursuing on an all-party basis, and um, uh, I'm sure the group leaders would be willing to shoulder, put their shoulders to the wheel in that regard, as well as maybe some of the other local politicians. Thanks, Councillor Wilson. And yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's right. You know, if, if there can be a, um, a cross-party effort in, in this regard, that would be very beneficial. Uh, and when we have the data uh, that we hope to receive uh, at, uh, in time for the, the next meeting, then then that will assist us in developing uh, a robust case uh, for going back to the necessary authorities. Councillor Illingworth. Just, just to report that <coughs> I've asked Luke Graham MP to investigate this and he has taken up with the relevant authorities in Westminster as from a political point of view. So uh, I've still to hear back and see what the result of that is. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, okay, if there are no further questions, uh, uh, we can approve the, the minutes uh, uh, and move on to item four on the agenda, which is the... Uh, internal audit update, uh, which is a, a brief report on this occasion, and Jackie, can I ask you to say a few words? Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, yes, this is the, the, the routine report which uh, provides information to the audit committee of the activity for uh, the internal audit function since, uh, since the last committee last month. Um, you can see at 1.3 that uh, since April, internal audit has been contacted uh, seven times. That's actually increased uh, since um, since the report was written, and we're now sitting at nine times uh, since April, which is a quite significant increase um, on uh, around about this time last year, uh, as throughout the whole of 1819, internal audit were contacted by services uh, 11 times in total. Uh, so, um, as part of our engagement, uh, we're getting a lot more uh, engagement back from services, requesting advice and assurance, um, however big or small. Uh, with regard to any kind of uh, new, uh, new uh, developments within services or just 
uh, request for advice, which is uh, very pleasing to note. Um, later on in the, in the agenda, there's uh, the internal audit uh, plan for you to consider, uh, but this just highlights some of the areas which, uh, which we've been working on since, uh, since the last uh, committee. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any questions, Councillor McDade? Thank you, Convener. The Chief Internal Auditor stole my question in her introduction there because I was going to ask, is seven times quite a lot? Because it sounded quite a lot for a two-month period since we last met. Um, and can you maybe give us a bit more background on why you think there's been such a dramatic increase? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it's, it's partly to do with internal audit being out and about in services in a different way. Uh, it's something that we've been working on for the last few years. Um, but also with uh, being some key developments uh, in some systems um, that, that um, services have contacted to say, can you, can we just run something past you? And do you think this looks as if um, these controls should be adequate? Uh, now that's really useful to us uh, in internal audit, uh, as much to, uh, um, as far as being aware of what, of what the changes are which are taking place uh, operationally. But also, it helps us to have a, a, a as full as possible and understanding of the overall control environment and changes that I can go back to sort of later in the year and ask how that's gone, uh, which is uh, it's just really good for me, uh, for me. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener. Um, indeed, I mean just to follow on from Councillor McDade's point. Um, I think it's healthy for the organisation, if I can put it that way, to be availing itself of of what I would call a critical friend um, approach to looking at changes and, and procedures and, and so forth, because I think that's, that, that's really important that people actually engage in that type of um, review. And it, it, I think for an organisation to do that is, is healthy, and we're, we're lucky to have the, the facility available. My question on page 17, appendix 1, when in the column audit committee there are there are no dates, some of these things will come one way or another to the audit committee, and others won't. Is, is the column deliberately blank, or 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 is it see the next paper or see the next set of papers type of answer? Uh, thank you. That that column will be populated as and when uh, papers are submitted to audit committee, uh, so that um, in in the fullness of time come the next committee. Uh, the internal audit update, this appendix will have all audits for the year on it, um, following approval of, um, of um, consideration of the audit plan, um, and then we'll start to populate that as and when audit committee have seen the, report, uh, the reports. Thank you. I like dates, convener, because then we know if we're running up to schedule or not. You'll get dates, Councillor Wilson, for sure. Any further questions? No. Can we agree to note the report? Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, <coughs> item five on the agenda, which is the internal audit follow-up. Uh, and again, Jackie, if you can uh, speak to this report, thanks. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, for the period that we were looking at for this particular report was uh, was actions that were due to have been completed uh, during April 2019. Um, there were five actions which were due to be completed, two of which have been completed, and three are in the appendix. Uh, to the report, um, either I or um, representatives from the service will uh, be available to answer any questions that you might have. Councillor McDade. Uh, thank you, Convener. My question is on page 24. Uh, it's in relation to 1819 of the leader um, first top action point, um, submission of claims. Uh, now, I understand that there is an issue at a national level with leader not paying out at the moment due to a Scottish audit, uh, Scottish level audit. So can I ask what our cash flow implications are from the fact that we already had delayed uh, processing of claims, if that's been, my understanding is that no claims are being paid out at a national level at the moment. Fraser, can you answer that? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, I'm unclear uh, about any issues at a national level. Um, the information I have is that the, the claims uh, are being processed now um, and being paid. So the ones that we have in the system at the moment uh, are, are, are being processed okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. 
Yes, um, just for clarity, there, there's uh, lots of um, times there's a reference to IT systems. Is this our IT system or is it um, Scottish Government or what? Yeah. Fraser again. Yeah. I, 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 again, my understanding is it's, 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 the, it's the national system and, uh, used to, to make the payments. Um, so we're relying on, on uh, your colleagues to, to help to deal with that. But my understanding is that those are being ironed out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener. On page 23, um, there's a, a good bit of text there. It says near the bottom that current operational structure until 30th of June, um, the, the resource link my view system. So there's, that's a week away, or less than a week away. Are we going to hit that target? Is my first question. Uh, do we, is MD able to answer that question? I don't, I don't know that we can be certain on that, Councillor uh, Wilson, but uh, the work has been ongoing, but um, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Convener. Um, it's probably safe to say we will not achieve that deadline. Um, there's been one or two teething problems in getting structure sorted out, so we're going to miss a 30th of June, but we're working towards getting that sorted out as soon as possible. Could we have a wee bit of definition about what as soon as possible is, given that this this was originally April and went went to June? So it's as soon as services get the information to uh, the payroll, our payroll colleagues, uh, we are chasing it up. Um, I'll chase it up again today, and maybe I could come back to you separately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, over the page, and, and following on from Councillor McDade's point about leader, was the there seemed to be a, a a number of problems, convener, with a number of European funding issues at the moment. This is this is separate from the the one that's been held up on a national basis because of the European audit. Am I right in thinking that this is if if what Fraser has said that the the funding is now flowing, albeit it was delayed. Um, so this is not the the one that Cosla is involved in, in in regard to um, there, there being a freeze virtually on, on European funding. I'm right in thinking this is a separate a separate issue. Yeah, um, Fraser, can yeah. you? <coughs> I, I can seek clarification. I think it's maybe the ESF, the, the employability uh, uh, grants. Um, that's the one that's, that's that's sticking a little bit. It's my understanding. It's a euphemism, but yes, I <laughs> understand. Okay, that's fine. The third third question um, is is relating to the, that as, as well. Maybe it's just linked in, and maybe it's covered by Fraser's answer earlier on. But again, um, the te technical going back to Councillor Anderson's point about technical issues. This is the the report that spans page 24 and 25 um, in the right hand column um, technical issues with IT systems and external change authorization processes so is, is that part of the Scottish government IT system that Councillor Anderson was asking about or is that ours my understanding is the Scottish government right okay thank you okay thank you if there are no further questions uh, can we agree to note this report so thank you. Okay, moving on again uh, uh, to uh, uh, a couple of uh, key uh, items on the agenda, starting off with uh, item six, which is uh, the internal audit strategy and plan for 2019-20. And again, Jackie, can I ask you to um, say a few words? Uh, thank you, convener. Um, uh, I present to, uh, to the Audit Committee the uh, proposed plan for 2019-20 uh, uh, for internal audit. Um, the approach that has been taken for pulling together this, uh, uh, this plan um, is uh, to enable the, the, the delivery of a risk-based internal audit service, which is required by the public sector internal audit standards, which is um, our professional standards and has been adopted by the Council. Uh, the approach that I've, been, that I've taken this year has been uh, very greatly added to by, uh, by the, the improvements in risk management, um, the, the risk management arrangements within the council, so that I've been in a position to place, uh, place a degree of reliance on the work that's been undertaken um, in that regard. Uh, and there is a separate report on this agenda um, 
detailing the, uh, the, um, uh, the risk management arrangements and the corporate risk register. So I've been able to rely quite heavily on the, uh, on the work that's been undertaken there uh, and I've been, I've been part of uh, some of, the, some of this, this work through, um, the, um, through a, a, a cross-service group that, that, uh, that meets within the council. Um, there's a lot more than just looking at risk registers that goes into pulling together the audit plan. Uh, so, um, uh, and it has, it has been guided as well by a lot of work that's been undertaken as part of the annual governance um, statement processes, pulling together the levels of assurance that, that the council receives from elsewhere. Whilst it's not a full formal um, assurance map, uh, it was sort of well on the way to having that, that level of information that I can rely on uh, to actually highlight where there could be gaps in assurance uh, or where additional assurance would be would be valuable so all this being uh, pulled into uh, pulled together um, there's a couple of things which are we're awaiting um, uh, one will be the outcomes from the best value review for the council uh, and the other being the uh, the outcomes from the uh, inspection of their health and social care partnership now both of those are uh, uh, considerably important documents which may impact on uh, the work that um, uh, that I would want to undertake going forward, and there's time within the audit plan to add um, to add some work arising from these outcomes. Um, so, so there is some time there, but it could mean that in the future, I'm, I'm wanting to bring some uh, some additional assignments forward. Uh, but at this point, I wanted you to see what uh, what uh, what the plan would be and what the themes currently are for uh, for um, for internal audit. Within the resources, um, you can see that I've got 4.8 uh, full-time equivalents within uh, within internal audit, um, which will be used to the max to, uh, to deliver the service. Um, there are some areas that we that we're required to undertake. Um, we've mentioned leader. There's, there's a requirement annually for a, uh, an audit of leader, so that that's within the plan. Likewise, the uh, bus service operators grant. There's a requirement for internal audit to do some work for us to receive that grant. So those two are, are within um, are within the audit plan. Um, uh, in addition to that, we have work that 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 goes uh, goes on throughout the year, supporting the national fraud initiative uh, and any other counter fraud uh, and corruption activities as, as is required. The themes are documented, um, and there's a link there to the corporate and the service risks, um, which which are based on the risk register at a snapshot in time, um, as Lisa will come on to highlight later. The risk registers are living, breathing documents, as they should be, um, and they're certainly not standalone. So we will, um, uh, as risks change, I will be keeping an eye on what is coming into and out of the corporate risk register, um, uh, and, and may come back to you in the future if, some, if another uh, risk uh, just become uh, become apparent. Um, the uh, the themes, as I say, are are, uh, are there. Uh, I haven't given a massively detailed description of the work. This will be developed with services at the time of the audit um, to ensure that, that at the time of the audit, when it's being undertaken, we're covering the risks that are uh, the key risks at that point in time. The key risks in, a, in an area at this point may well be different in February next year, uh, and we need to be able to have the flexibility to uh, to respond uh, accordingly. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions um, on uh, on uh, what's in the plan. Thank, thank you, Jackie. And can I just um, uh, thank you and your colleagues for um, for the work that's been done to uh, to develop uh, this um, this plan to uh, to this stage. Uh, and I'll be very interested to hear what elected members have to, to say about the content of the report. A couple of things I just wanted to mention myself, which was, first of all, in, re in relation to the internal audit resources issue. Um, we, we clearly are um, in a situation where um, we, we have limited resources. Um, uh, we've, uh, um, Moira has... Uh, left uh, the council and we're uh, recruiting a, a replacement. Uh, <coughs> in addition, uh, it has been agreed that, uh, that Jackie will take over the role as Chief Internal Auditor of the Health and Social Care Partnership, um, which is, is helpful in, in terms of the joined up 
uh, approach between the council and uh, the partnership. Uh, but it's all, uh, you know, it does affect the fact that the, there are limited resources available means that, uh, you know, it's it's a, I think a, it's a challenge to to um, to achieve everything that we're, we're we're seeking to achieve. But I'm sure that Jackie and her team can do, can do that. What what is important is that um, a third of uh, of uh, employee time is. Uh, is taken up on what might be regarded as business as usual in terms of, uh, as Jackie mentioned, uh, counter fraud and corruption activity, uh, uh, monitoring of agreed actions, uh, and and work work with the IJB, uh, and and also continuous professional development. So uh, you know there is limited resources, and that is recognised at the moment. Um, so yeah, I mean. Uh, I, I'm delighted also from a personal point of view to see that we're taking a more thematic approach to uh, to the agenda here uh, and uh, that uh, there is scope to uh, to to change and to augment uh, the planned activity depending on the outcome of, or, or any changes to the corporate risk register during the year. So uh, with, without further ado, can I ask if there are any questions? Councillor McDade. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I asked the question the last time of Chief Internal Auditor, and I'm wondering if we have any more details about uh, what the Tay Cities uh, deal audit work is likely to look like. Uh, thank you. At this point, I'm uh, in negotiation with my colleagues in uh, in Dundee, who are the hosts, uh, and also the other um, local authorities, which are party to Tay Cities deal. To, to ensure that we're, uh, we're covering the risks that are appropriate to our individual organisations and to the plan as a whole. Um, so at this point, I can't give you a detail, but uh, but it is something that which is being undertaken as a collaborative approach. Follow up. Yeah. Uh, just uh, another quick one um, on the transformation point. Uh, the chief executive of the council has expressed uh, her desire that at the end of this transformation program that transformation will just become the business of the council and its day-to-day -day workings um, how do you see this feeding into the audit of transformation going forward uh, that will um, require me simply to, to look at that as business as usual but as it stands at the moment there is uh, there is a, um, there are transformation projects which are due to deliver uh, and as a, an audit committee I'm sure you'd want to know whether or not they are on track and delivering as has been reported to uh, to elected members um, and that's going to be the purpose of this particular audit but for future plans um, really I will sort of react to to what the, the current landscape will be at that point. Okay can I ask uh, Lisa to come in as well please? I think the Chief Executive's change in approach was recognising that a lot of things that's previously been badged as transformation activity was really just about driving efficiencies, incremental improvements um, basically cutting the cloth to, to fit the resources that we have. Um, and that that essentially is now our day job. Change is, managing change is the day job, that is what we do. In terms of significant projects or programmes of work, however, these will still be within a structured governance framework. We have a strategic innovation and improvement investment board um, that's been created that will be looking at capital programme and the development of capital projects, but also key change initiatives um, cultural change initiatives, behavioural change initiatives and programmes of work or improvement or planned improvement work. So that framework will still be there. R reports from that will still be made regularly to SPNR. And if audit issues um, are, are flagged up, then we link proactively with the internal audit team if there's something that we won't advise or guidance on in terms of any aspect of programme delivery. Thanks, Councillor McDade. Yeah, yeah follow-up to that, if I may. So just to be Clear then, just sort of probe a bit further on what the head of legals just outlined. Um, there won't be a document essentially that's transformation program, but essentially the framework will still exist. Yeah. So, what exactly is the difference apart from the fact that we've not written it up as a document? I think the, I think the key issue is the fact that we're not having a standalone strategy, which isn't integrated into what we do in everyday business. So. That bit about, you know, we only think about improvement or innovation or efficiency if it falls within this gamut, that's what we're looking 
to, to, to set aside the fact that um, managing change, managing cultural change, driving improvement is actually now a key business process. It's a key business activity for officers across the council. We still have to have a programme management and a project management regime, which we have, and we think we've made some improvements to that by creating a strategic board so that we can take a more cohesive and comprehensive overview of all of our improvement and our vest investment activity across the piece. I don't know if any of my finance colleagues want to chip in around some of the thinking around the strategic board, but it, the, the programme and project management framework has to be there. There has to be controls around how we deliver to ensure that we do so within budget, within time frame, and, and that we actually derive benefits from the activity that we are undertaking. So there is still a governance framework around that. Is it a little bit of paper that says we only think about transformation if it falls within this category? That's what we're looking to eradicate. If you'll indulge me, convener, um, just to probe slightly further on this, I think that I understand a lot more from what the head of legal said there. Um, my understanding was that part of the move to Perkin Ross offer, I think, yes, agenda is that we're going to, uh, as it were, take more risk um, to try and achieve more. Um, and if we continue to, as it were, use traditional methods around some of this stuff, then we will not achieve as much as we might otherwise. So do you, in your view, believe that structure is flexible enough to actually see us achieve radical change? Or is it is it not maybe quite as... Uh, I, think, I think you're conflating two things there, if, if I can um, explain. We have to have project management. If we've got multi-million pounds capital programmes, there needs to be a governance framework where there's transparency in terms of how we're spending money, what we're spending money on, what that's actually achieving and what benefits that's deriving. So that framework there is about um, projects once committed um, or agreed. It also provides the framework for that, that step that I think is even more vital, which is testing the viability of suggestions around projects. So when there are suggestions for projects or programmes of work or funding initiatives, there needs to be a mechanism whereby people who are who have an expertise or, or, or technical ability or, or qualifications can actually look at that and go, does that stack up? And does that align with the business objective of this council? So that's the, that's what the programme, uh, that's what the governance framework allows that to do. In terms of how the person can Ross offer shapes up or whatever that comes to be called at the end of the consultation period. What that will allow us to do is rethink how we deliver and design services. But once we've committed to a, a, a programme of work in whatever shape or form the council in partnership with the community designs or shapes, there still then has to be the framework around it. So it's part of that process. It is not the thing, if you see what I mean. It's, it's the bit that gives you the assurance in terms of spending public money. It's the bit that satisfies the reporting arrangements for SPNR and the budgeting monitoring arrangements. It's the check and the balance to make sure that the things that we're doing is the stuff that we need to be doing and that we're still doing the right things with the resources that, that we have and we're making the best use of that. And then the next layer of assurance is internal audit coming back and checking that controls are in place or providing advice and guidance around controls in place. And I think as we do move to a different type of service redesign and delivery through co-creation or whatever, the risk landscape changes quite radically, which is why, A, we've shaped the approach from internal audit because we're moving, we're delivering services in a different way. There's much more partnership, there's much more collaboration, there may be, there may be outsourcing, there may be all sorts of different varieties on how we deliver public services. What we do know for a definite fact is that the council as the sole provider is a thing of the past. And so therefore our governance arrangements around that have to be flexible enough to be able to accommodate and deliver that, but also to provide assurance to the public that we're spending the public money wisely and we're delivering the things that they need. Does that? You yeah. know, that answers my question. That's useful. It's a useful explanation, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you're, uh, you've got your answers, Councillor McDade. Uh, Councillor Anderson.
it will, uh, the review will, will, uh, will cover both areas, uh, really looking at this as being a potential risk area, not <coughs> just for, um, for the protection of staff, uh, against allegations of, um, any, of any kind of corruption or fraud. Uh, so we're looking at, at, that, this, at that also from a, from a counter-fraud uh, angle as well. Can I guess just comment? I'm very comforted to hear that because I, I was in a position of see, seeing some video uh, footage of the recycling centre and it was quite alarming that there seemed to be a lot of confusion and people coming and going. So I'm very encouraged that that is being reviewed. Thanks. And Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Convener. I think I have three points. Uh, first of all, I'm, I don't want to rearrange the agenda, but I think it might have been useful to have had paper seven, which is a kind of high-level paper before paper six. Um, uh, the, your point was well made, Convener, about a third of our resource goes on uh, just ev everyday business. My question is, is there any way that we can alter that or change that? I mean, the bus service operator's grant certification always fascinates me because it sounds like a watch paint drying job in a, in a sense that it's, it's always there. It's all, and we do it in support of our colleagues in the PTU. I, I know why we do it. Um, but it just seems to be a grind. Do we need to do that every year? Could we do it every second year? Or are there anything we could do to make some of these, um, and they are routine jobs, um, I think, that uh, serve a purpose in their audit process. They're not there just for fun, but uh, that we could help release a wee bit of extra extra resource. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Um, just picking up on uh, the bus service operators grant, uh, specifically at this point, um, that's something that has been required to be done twice a year. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've renegotiated uh, that we can now just do that the once, so that we're saving uh, saving ourselves uh, resources. So we're just doing the audit once a year, which is uh, a lot better for us. Um, uh, so, so we do take account of the fact that um, we want to be able to dedicate as much resource to the audit plan as possible. However, we also do need to be aware that. Um, you know, the 67% is in, uh, includes what's what's dedicated time to 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 the planned audits, um, and we do need to have some consultancy time, which is not planned, so that we've got the flexibility to be able to respond uh, quite quickly to any requests for advice or any uh, internal investigations that that are required. Finally, convener, um, this is maybe a waspish comment rather than a question, but. We, some of us in the room could eliminate one of these items on the list quite readily. Um, however, it's useful to have it there as a precaution. Thank you. I'm on page 30. Right, okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Convener. Um, I take the point a third of the work is business as usual. I hear uh, Councillor Wilson's comments and I'm not going to get on to section 7 but the new approach I think is right it, it, it's dynamic but it's ongoing however with what we're doing I just want to ask Jackie this does not preclude where considerations require us taking a much more rifle approach narrow approach on certain specific areas secondly you mentioned with the Health and Social Care Partnership. Last time we looked at the Carers Act, it was a good report. I think I mentioned we, we weren't considering young carers, although that's a, an area where uh, you know, it is viewed as probably low risk. But with the Health and Social Care Partnership, my second question is, when will we know what the themes that will drive out of, out of that area? What they'll be. Thank uh, thanks for the question. Um, each individual audit, um, as it's been scoped, will vary from being either wide or very targeted audits. Um, so, for example, uh, the audit on uh, contracting will necessarily be looking at how individual contracts are monitored, so it will be very, very focused. Um, whereas uh, the review with regard to inclusion will be more 
more of a wide uh, or wide ranging how the arrangements are being uh, are being implemented uh, kind of review. Um, with regard to the health and social care uh, partnership, we're awaiting the um, the outcome for the inspection. I've uh, I've recently been appointed as uh, uh -huh. chief auditor for um, as in this Ooh. month, so it's it's very it's very recent. Um, and when I'm pulling together the plan for the health and social care partnership, which will draw from that, there will obviously be uh, some benefit for those reviews for, for the council and vice versa. Uh, but I will be very clear in my own head that you know what reviews are being undertaken to support the integration joint board in um, in undertaking their functions and also for the council. But we. I can't actually say exactly when that's going to come forward. That will depend on when we get the report. Um, I know I think I should hope that, that we'd have something for September, but I don't want to commit to that um, in the event that, that that there's any delays. Okay, thanks oh, for that. Uh, and, I th uh, and I think as well in terms of both the health and social care partnership mm -hmm. inspection and, and the best value re review, uh, these are expected to be received during the summer recess. Mm -hmm which is, of course, a summer recess for elected members and not for officers. Hmm. And finally, can I just say I'm glad that we are returning to the issue of contracting. It's come up before, um, but we it was a very small sample previously of only, I think, five contracts, but two had been posted long after you know, the, the date that was due. And I, I'd like to get rid of certainty on that because there's one in particular, I forget the value, I think it's about 80,000 that had not been posted onto public uh, contracts website until about half a year after the event. So we really need to be clear on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, uh, actually managing contracts is a, um, has been um, a significant audit on our um, audit plan for the last couple of years. Uh, and I, I don't see that that really changing because the risks associated with management, managing contracts will uh, go on. Um, uh, but what I would just like to say is actually this is something which a lot of local authorities are only just picking up now. They're starting to look at the management of contracts as being risky. Uh, the, the majority of, uh, of local authorities I, I, I discovered last week look more at the awarding of contracts. Um, and uh, a, a surprising number have not looked at man how contracts are managed. So uh, although we've had small samples, uh, when we've had outcomes from that, um, you know, we're very much sort of you know, ahead of the game and looking at more. Thanks. And it's crucial that there is indeed transparency and confidence in the system. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions, um, can we note the report and approve the strategy and plan for 2019-20? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, taking on board Councillor Wilson's comments about it might have been helpful to have item seven on the agenda before item six. Uh, in hindsight, I, I would have to agree with him. And uh, but nevertheless, it's, a, it's uh, an important discussion uh, now. And if we can hand over to Lisa Simpson, Head of Legal and Governance Services, to take us through the report. Thanks. Thank you, Convener. Um, this is a, a, a fairly general update progress report. You councillors may be aware that we took a different approach in terms of a risk management framework and developed a new framework which was approved in 2017 by SPNR in the course of 2018-19. Um, and taking um, that preview, we've been embedding that risk management framework, and that's actually been quite a, a detailed and extensive piece of work, which has been around um, developing the toolkit, um, getting a cohort of officers um, certified as risk practitioners so that we have a consistent approach across the organisation, doing a number of risk-based workshops with each service management team and also risk workshops with the corporate management group, and risk um, engagement with the EOT. The next stage of that, this is very much work in progress. This is a, a, a progress in terms of where we are to date. We've also extensively reviewed the corporate risk register, which is also up to date for your noting. As Jackie picked up in that point, um, risk is, is fluid. It's not, a static, it's not a static issue. It's not a one-off annual activity that we look at. We update the we update the risk register, it then goes on a shelf and it gathers dust. Um, 
this is something that's, that's very much looked at as an ongoing part of officers' day jobs. Um, and similarly, risk management is, is a function of this committee. The next stage will be to come back and do some detailed development workshops with this committee and in partnership with the scrutiny committee who are looking at whether or not our risk controls are helping us to achieve good performance um, because that's the whole purpose of, of um, our risk management activities to ensure that we remove the barriers and manage the barriers to achieving our objectives. So this sets out the um, corporate risk register as is at this moment, but as I say, that could change. It's, it's looked at, it's monitored regularly. It provides you assurance that we have a structured and consistent approach to risk management across the organisation and at every level. It's making sure that risks are managed in the right place by the people who can actually affect the change and manage and mitigate those risks. There's a clear escalation process where risks have to be either escalated to the corporate management group, who are essentially the custodians of, of the corporate strategic risks for the organisation. There's clear escalation in terms of um, political um, assurance, which is up to this committee, um, and in terms of changing risk profiles to SPNR. What we'll be looking to work on once we've had the development session with yourself is looking to revise the risk appetite statement. And I think it picks up on Councillor McDade's um, point earlier that our approach to risk and our appetite for risk has to change and has to modify if we are going to actually deliver the change and innovation that as a public organisation we need to do. So this is very much a, a, a work in progress. Managing risk is the day job. Um, I'm happy to take any questions around our approach and our progress to date. Um, and as I said, we'll be looking at this in much more detail when we do a development session with yourselves um, early doors after recess, I think is what we agreed. But I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, I suspect there may be one or two questions on this important uh, paper. <coughs> Councillor Wilson. Thanks, convener. Well, there's a risk that I might wear my eyes out with the size of the print of the corporate risk register, but I've brought my trusty magnifying glass with me um, this, this, this morning. Um, it, I think this is a good paper. I think it, it, it helps summarise things, and it, it actually sets it out, despite the small print, convener, pretty clearly. It also shows some of the major mitigation proposals or, or options. And that's good because it takes a lot of things from red to either, I think it's roughly orange or, or, or yellow. My question is, and I'm not sure where intervened in this, the risk of pressure to our staff, right? Because we're reducing the number of staff, we've increasing demands. Yes, we've got loads of ideas about change and innovation and everything else, but there's still a lot of pressure um, because the public still are expecting the same level of service that we, quite bluntly in some areas, cannot and should not, probably, be delivering. So it, I didn't see one that says risk to staff um, pressure. Um, I, I'll use my words carefully, but uh, which of these, perhaps, or do we think there could be in all of them, right? But should we be acknowledging the question is that we particularly mention that as part of one of them? And just to explain, these are corporate risks which we're seeing, which we're seeing requires um, the organisation as a whole to look at and to manage and to mitigate. There are also strategic risks sitting in every service. So if there is particular pinch points of pressures around particular teams, that's picked up as a workforce pressure in the strategic risk register, for example, of ECS or Corporate and Democratic or H&E. Where we are looking to address that, gener that general point and that general risk about do we have the right people doing the right things, that's wrapped up in our, our workforce planning risk. So as part of our workforce planning and resourcing, we would be looking to make sure that we were directing our human resources in the right the right place and also the flip side of that one of the mitigating factors is working closely in terms of the organizational development aspect to make sure that the workforce that we have has the appropriate skills and knowledge to be able to deliver services as they are going forward so we would have that particular concern wrapped up in the workforce management risk because that is a key aspect of workforce management making sure we've got enough people doing the right stuff thank you 
Thank you. Are there any further questions, Councillor McDade? Thanks. It's on page uh, well, it's 15 of the uh, back report. I'm not quite sure what it is in the main papers. Um, it's, it's the actual corporate risk register, uh, which is called, uh, as Councillor Wilson has mentioned, it's in very small type. Um, it's the very last one, um, number 17, and it's about the CPP. And the inherent score is 16 and the residual score is 16, um, which I just wanted to probe a bit because the council is the main administrative partner of the community planning partnership. So I would have thought it would be uh, more within our control to control this than perhaps uh, the lack of a reduction in implies. So can we get a bit of more information on that? I think the, the reason, I mean, it's, it's very strange that you have a, a, an inherent score and a risk score that doesn't change when you've got the um, controls in. This is actually reflecting the fact that the CP governance framework is undergoing a review at the moment. And so therefore, we've left it at, at that 16 until we actually see the output and the outcomes from that review to see how that reshapes. I would very much expect that once that review is completed and the framework has been refreshed, that that 16 score will go down significantly. Okay, thank you. That's very sure. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Convener. Just to add to what Lisa was saying, um, my understanding is it's not just for members of audit committee and uh, scrutiny, but we're looking to do a session for all councillors. Yes. And that will include, I know it'll be a, probably a tough gig because it's 40 pages, it's quite hard reading, include the Accounts Commission Audit Scotland report that was produced a few few months back. I'm not, uh, I'd have thought probably the best way to present it is going to be with uh, kind of case studies, you know, to illustrate the point. But I think that's desirable. A um, couple of things. One, these are, are the strategic risk register. At the end of the day, these are judgments that have to be made by senior officers and judgments change according to circumstances. Well, we, an audit committee, will have the right to challenge the scoring uh, maybe specific areas. We think, you know, for instance, Council McDade alluded to, uh, to one area just a minute ago. Secondly, uh, this committee will have the right to see the risk registers for the three service areas as well. Don't want too many risk registers, but it may be necessary in certain circumstances. I, I, also to provide you with a degree of assurance that when we're looking at the corporate risk register that you have in front of you here, we don't look at that in isolation because actually the other three workbooks behind that are CDS's risk, strategic risks, HE, h and &E strategic risks, the um, ECS strategic risks, and we're going to be doing some work over the summer with the IJB, and so there'll also be IJB strategic risks, and we may also be drawing out strategic risks that flow directly from our partnerships and our alleos. So we will have oversight of all of that. There was no way I was bombarding you with all of those pages in tiny print. And I think in terms of the development session, I don't see that as being a one-off session and that's us done our job. I think our risk management development sessions will be something that we will plan over the year and it may well then provide you, the audit committee, with an opportunity to say we'd like to focus on these thematic risks or risks in this particular area whereby we can get relevant officers around to explain why we've scored things the way we've scored, take on view, on board your viewpoints. Because as you say, it's, it's, it's our best judgment in terms of what we think we need to do to put in place processes and, and controls to mitigate and manage those risks. Um, and you're right, it is a judgment call, but you're also right in that it's fluid and something that might be our biggest risk today might be usurped by something that's a far bigger risk tomorrow. So the whole, idea, the, the whole approach is the fact that what you're looking at there is a snapshot in time and this will constantly be monitored and reviewed. And we have an opportunity as, an, as a, a committee to engage with officers on a very regular basis out with the committee meeting structure but in a development forum 
um, so that we have a good understanding and a good grasp of the risk landscape for the council. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for that, and Councillor McDade. Uh, thanks, Convener. It's just a, a point for uh, consideration by the committee in general. Um, the head of legal gave very useful answer to us as elected members there. But if you remember the public, perhaps watching this back on YouTube, there was an awful lot of acronyms in it, and we're all guilty of using them. We talk about ECS and everything else, but actually, uh, I am aware that uh, members of the public are beginning to watch these things because people are starting to mention to me that they're watching it. And it, if you were to watch some of the answers you wouldn't necessarily understand them unless you're fluent in uh, council speak. Well, for the voidness of the doubt and for any members of the public who are watching, the service risk registers will also be attached to the overall council risk register so that anybody looking at the council risk register can then have access to service specific risks. And thank you. I, I, I share your dislike of TLAs, or as I call them, or three-letter acronyms. So thank you for that. Um, are there any further... Uh, further questions? Okay, th uh, can we first of all thank uh, Lisa and her colleagues for um, the considerable effort being made to uh, to develop this uh, risk register and look forward to the uh, the development sessions uh, after the recess. Uh, and it is important, I think, that um, uh, that all elected members uh, are are as aware as possible of of uh, of this aspect of. Um, the work that we do, that we all do. Uh, so, can we agree to note the report? Thank you. Okay, uh, and moving on to the final item in the agenda, which we've been waited f waiting for with bated breath: uh, the unaudited draft annual accounts for 2018-19. And if I can possibly ask Mr. Mackenzie to um, give his uh, introduction. Thank you, convener. Um, the Council's unaudited accounts for 2018-19 require to be submitted to the Controller of Audit by the 30th of June. The accounts have been prepared in accordance with both the 2018-19 Sit for Code of Practice and Local Authority Accounting and the Local Authority Accounts Scotland Regulations 2014. The regulations require an annual review of the Council's system of internal control and members will be aware that the annual governance statement for 2018-19 included within the accounts was approved by the scrutiny committee on the 12th of June. The next step is for the unaudited accounts to be considered by those charged with governance at a meeting to be held no later than the 31st of August. And consideration of the unaudited accounts by the committee today meets this requirement. Following consideration, the committee is asked to authorise that I sign the unaudited accounts for 2018-19. The accounts may then be formally submitted to the Council's external auditors for statutory audit and made available for public inspection. It is anticipated that the draft unsigned audited accounts for 2018-19 and our auditors draft report on the 18-19 audit will be submitted for approval to the committee at its meeting on the 18th of September and reported to Council on the 25th of September. A significant amount of work has gone into the preparation of the unaudited accounts from across the Council, and I'm grateful to service colleagues, and I'd ask that, that colleagues feed that back, partner organisations, and in particular, my own team led by Scott Walker and Alison O'Brien. And we've touched on this earlier, but I'd also note the support of the Head of Legal and Governance in discussions of Audit Scotland with the application of statutory guidance and the Loans Fund. This has now been resolved in line with the Council's understanding of the legal position following clarification by Audit Scotland. The financial performance of the Council in 2018-19 is reflected in the unaudited statements as summarised in the management commentary on pages 44 to 56 of the documents in front of you. This is followed by the annual governance statement on pages 57 to 62. There are significant differences between the presentation of information in the accounts and the proper accounting practice and the basis used to monitor and project revenue and capital expenditure throughout the year. However, if I can make a few overall comments. For revenue expenditure, the main variances on the cash equivalent basis are summarised in the table on page 48 and detailed in pages 49 and 50 of a management commentary. 
not underspends are shown. These reflect the combination of savings, the rephasing of expenditure, and additional income. The unaudited net underspend in the cost of services is £8.2 million, and the overall underspend is £9.986 million pounds in 2018-19, both figures subject to audit. Services delivered sufficient underspend to allow resources to be carried forward under budget flexibility, as approved by Council in February. The unaudited overspend on health and social care expenditure funded by the Council is £741,000, which requires to be met from reserves. Gross expenditure on capital in 2018-19 was £78.6 million, comprising £21.3 million of expenditure on the housing revenue account and £57.3 million on the general fund, predominantly on roads infrastructure, flood protection and school estates projects. Subject to audit, uncommitted general fund reserves at the 31st of March 2019 are £12.674 million, pounds, equivalent to 3.6% of the net 2019 revenue budget. This is in line with a reserve strategy approved by Council in February. The balance sheet on page 68 shows the resources of the Council and how these are financed, reflecting the Council's overall financial position. The Council's net assets in the balance sheet have reduced by £8.4 million to approximately £550 million as at the 31st of March 2019. There is an increase of £30 million in the valuation of property, plant and equipment, arising largely from continued capital investment. This is offset by increases in long-term liabilities from additional borrowing to fund the capital programme and movements in the Council's net pension liability. The unaudited financial statements for 2018-19 also include the group accounts which incorporate the Council's interests in Culture of Perth and Canoss, Live Active Leisure, Horse Course Arts, TSA Contracts and the Perth and Canoss Integration Joint Board. There are also statements for the Council's charitable trusts and common good funds. The remuneration report which includes information on senior councillors and defined senior officers also forms part of the financial statements and is separately audited. Happy to take questions, convener. <coughs> thank you, Mr McKenzie. And first of all, can I um, thank you and your colleagues uh, for uh, the efforts made in uh, developing and, and presenting these unaudited accounts to the committee today? Uh, I, I have to say that uh, there's, a, there's obviously a huge amount of information in, in these accounts. Uh, and the narrative uh, reads well and is easy to understand, so you're to be commended uh, for that. Uh, can I also, um, because obviously um, modesty prevented you from uh, flagging up one particular uh, issue which is uh, hidden away on page 7 of the report, uh, which, uh, which indicates an underspend of a million pounds due to proactive treasury management uh, and the council share of Tayside contract surplus. That that translated in uh, you know is, is is essentially you know through the efforts of your treasury management team you have saved the council a whole lot of money. So thank you again uh, for uh, for that effort. Um, can I ask colleagues uh, if they have any questions on the unaudited draft statement? Councillor, Councillor McDade, no, no, Councillor Anderson, we're fighting for it over there. Councillor Anderson. Okay, um, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm looking at page 53, and uh, down at the bottom paragraph, it mentions the Perth and Kinross offer, which we're all very um, excited about. Uh, however, how does the internal and external auditors measure this? and the risk plans of the Perth offer. How is this going to work? Because it's very much in its infancy. Sorry, but where, where are we finding this comment? Page 53. 10 of the main report. Page 10 of my report, right. OK, thank, thanks, Councillor yeah. Anderson. Um, that's included in the, the, the purpose of the management commentary is really to tell the story of the Council. So that's not really there to be audited or measured at this stage. 
It's there for information. It allows the auditors to understand what we're doing and where we're going. Um, and hopefully that's what that conveys to the reader. Uh, thank you, because within most of it, there's lots of fi figures. and There's no figures there. And we just I wondered what was happening. OK, thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor McDade. Um, first of all, can I make a point about just in terms of I uh, appreciate preparing uh, what is a very hefty document and a very important one takes time. Um, but given that the committee, and I have no issue with the accounts, I'm just going to say that to begin with, but given that the committee is asked to authorise the head of finance to sign these off and he has to submit them by the 30th of June, the fact that we're considering them on the 26th of June, if there were to be an issue that we had, it wouldn't really allow much time for anything to be sorted out. So just in future, it might be helpful for us to meet the previous week. Uh, I know that these things are all very time sensitive, but just from a governance point of view, if we actually have to meet a certain deadline and we can't actually alter anything before the said deadline, it would be a bit of an issue. So just okay, making that uh, point. Your comments are noted. Um, I'm not sure that there was a question there, but yeah, thank no, you I, I said, said, said yeah. at the start it was going to be a point. Um, okay. Uh, I do actually have um, some queries just on the uh, page 95 of the main report or 138 um, of the uh, full papers, as it were. Um, and I'm just first of all, I'm wondering why we go back quite so far in terms of, we seem to go back several years uh, in terms of salaries and um, pensions, etc., uh, as opposed to the immediate past year. But um, yeah, so first of all, if I can get an answer to why we go back, because we go back, I think, to 2017 in terms of uh, contributions, etc. So. so thank you for that question. Um, we're required to show comparators. Um, it's as simple as that. So there's the 16, sorry, there's the 17, 18 information and there's 18, 19. And because it straddles two councils, there's a lot of councillors referred and ex councillors referred to through the remuneration report. So that should be cleared up next year as the 1718 information drops out. Okay, that's that's helpful. Um, and uh, also um, the just there was um, considerable uh, press coverage earlier in the year uh, about um, packages that were offered uh, to former staff um, and obviously this, this is detailed here and I think from my point of view it's quite important that we acknowledge that we aren't trying to hide any information, it is all here in our uh, audited accounts for people to see uh, and for the public to see. Um, and I was just wondering if, and perhaps this is more a question that the um, Head of Legal and Governance can answer or the Head of Finance. Um, if they could sort of give us a bit of reassurance that the packages that have been offered were and are commensurate with the roles, etc., that these people have performed, as I, you know, I believe they have been outlined. Stuart, thanks. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Councillor McDade, for your question. Um, with reference to to the. Uh, the other retirement packages because that, that's what they are. Um, for senior officers, those that are subject to prior approval by the Secret Policy and Resources Committee within the framework and policy approved by Council. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Donaldson. Um, I think Councillor Wilson. N simple procedural one just on the, the, the actual main body of the report um, the period of time on page 36 of the, 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 the covering report para 3 5 that will be a, accounts will be available for public inspection between the 1st and the 19th of July 2019 inclusive with objections by the 22nd um, it sort of follows on from I think Councillor McDade's point about timing um, that's not an awful long time to allow comment um, and it's in the, the school holidays um, 
presumably we're just tied into that because that's that's how it's I been. Um, yeah, I think Mr. McKenzie can answer that there's one. A, Thank there's you. just a, a formula for that, and we can't do much about it. But yeah, I think it's an unfortunate timing for those members of the public who would be keen enough to de delve into this. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. That is prescribed under regulation. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions, Councillor Donaldson? Okay, I have two questions. My second question is entirely disconnected to the first. The first question is, I think you may expect, on the subject of pensions. However, it was a recommendation one of KPMG in their significant risks and other focus areas, and it stated that management could, should consider whether the assumptions relating to the pension fund are appropriate for Pathkin Ross Council and its workforce, and a review had to be carried out. I think that's meant to be by 30th of June. Can I ask, who, uh, has that happened and that's been recovered? Thank you, Councillor Dodson. Um, any review is obviously going to be high level because none of the officers <coughs> are consulting actuaries or members of Institute of, of Actuaries. The, the underlying assumptions within the presentation of the, the Council's pension liability are highly complex, highly technical, uh, and we employ, as you'll be aware, as members will be aware, actuaries to undertake that work for us. So yes, uh, there will be uh, a management review, but that is very high level by definition because of the nature of the work that's required to provide the figures within the accounts. Okay, I just follow up by asking the, with Barnet Waddingham, I'm just looking at uh, the report, um, I think it's uh, just before page 91, on their assumptions. Have, have their assumptions changed from the previous year? I uh, was just looking at figures on life expectancy, is it, or is it much the same as before? Thank you, Councillor Dawson. If, if I could take a light to members to page 93, uh, or page 50 of the uh, accounts, um, and the principal assumptions used by the actuary. Um, there's, there's maybe two things which are significant. One is more significant than the other. Um, assumptions on life expectancy have been revised um, marginally downward. Um, that would be unfitting of your Chief Financial Officer not to bring some gloom to the proceedings. Um, if you have a look at the, at the information which is compiled annually by the Office of National Statistics, which we publish, that's similar. So life expectancy, um, at least in the short term, isn't improving. That's perhaps not a particularly positive message. Um, of more significant in terms of the calculation of the council's liability is the rate uh, for discounting scheme liabilities, which has moved from 2.6% last year to 2.4% in the current year. That impacts on pension liabilities because, in effect, it means that the present cost, which is what we're reporting, of future payments has increased. However, if one allows for the pick-up in markets, I think I might say since the end of March, that's partly countered by a general uh, uh, increase in market uh, value of our assets. But I need to look at that. I just want to ask one final question, a point in pensions. Um, with the increase in teachers' salaries uh, earlier this year, um, I think we know the position on the local government pension scheme broadly, but with the increase in teachers' salaries, uh, with the teachers' pension scheme, well, can I just ask what the position is there? So the teachers' pension scheme is, is effectively um, treated as a... I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to, is that defined? It's a, it's a national scheme, so it's out with, it's out with the liabilities that we'd show in our balance sheet. I think that's the essential, essential um, and key point there. I might come back uh, separately on that on our occasion. Completely separate question. 
Page 129, Common Good Fixed Assets, and it reads, The Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 requires the Council to establish and maintain a list of property which is held as part of the common good. The view of property titles to facilitate the eventual publication of the list has commenced. However, until the review is complete, could I ask when we're hopeful that that review will be complete? Because I think for those of us involved, and I don't think there's any conflict of interest here, but involved with various common goods, uh, good funds, I think it would be helpful to know what are the assets held by those funds, especially in terms of property. We don't currently have a common good register and we are working to try and develop that, but the main issue has been resource, um, resources. We do have someone in working over the summer who is um, trying to pick up on some of that work um, and the way that we're managing that is to respond to queries as and when people make any requests or, or um, query any information about potential common good assets. As to the value, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I'm sure we could... Um, because there is no register and there is no um, easy way to do that, we would need to, you would need to make a, a, if there was a particular property then we could do that, but there isn't actually a common good register at the moment. Would there be a hope that, uh, I hear what you're saying, that uh, the difficulties that may be involved in particular accessing historical records but we, at very least, by, say, this time next year, will have a more detailed understanding, or is it something that's just about, you know, pro... You know, I think it's re required under the legislation, is it not, that there is a, 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 a comprehensive register? Yeah, there isn't a finite point as to when that register has to be in place, and I think other local authorities are in the same position with us, um, as us, in terms of... Um, the resources to simply pull together that register. Um, the way we, that we are managing our, our responsibilities around that is to respond to requests as and when we get them and checking out properties as and when there are inquiries about that. And if, if um, common good properties um, are being dealt with or looked at as part of other things, then we've taken the opportunity to then attach that to, to, to a database and we have someone in working over the summer but they are only here for the summer um, and it's it's a resourcing issue okay yeah thank you thank you for that and I think um, you know obviously uh, you know, it's a relatively new piece of legislation and uh, it's encouraging to see that we are trying to make progress in uh, fulfilling our obligations in regard to uh, that piece of legislation um, are there any Further questions on the accounts, Councillor McDade? Yeah, thanks. It's on page 66 and 67 um, for 109 of the main papers. Uh, it's around capital expenditure and capital financing. So under 35, it talks about um, that the value of assets acquired under P PFI or PPP contracts um, are shown in the value um, here of assets. Uh, so first question is, if we don't yet own the asset, why are we counting it as ours? Because it technically belongs to someone else. It will belong to us. In some cases, the campuses will belong to us, but at this moment, they don't. Uh, and then the second one is under 36. Um, and I would like to um, ask for the Head of Finance's uh, view on the pressure that PFI contracts are putting on the Council's accounts. Thank you. I think I got the short straw there. Um, so the PFI assets are on the balance sheet because um, when we brought in international accounting standards a um, number of years ago, that was one of the requirements. Um, and since then, we've had to account for them on our balance sheet. So it's really the accounting standards that are determining uh, that fact. Um, note 36 obviously details... Um, our future liabilities, um, the end part of the note, in terms of the payments that we have to make under PPP. 
on an annual basis, um, our unitary charge payments are going up by um, RPI. Um, so there is an inflation element that they're going up each year, and that's the, probably the budget pressure that we need to increase the budget by each year. We have got the unitary charges in the budget, but they are increasing by RPI um, each year. Um, so follow-up question, if I may. So first of all, I'm um, just curious about the um, international accounting standards and why they require you to account for something that you don't own. Uh, that, that's my first question. The second one is around, um, I've, uh, I've uh, probed around this before, in that um, are any of our contracts, our uh, PPP, PFI contracts, whatever uh, the campuses, for example, are, um, at a point where, given how low the borrowing rate is from the UK government, uh, would we be in a better position to borrow the money from the government and buy ourselves out the contracts, as a number of local authorities have done down south, where they're making significant savings over the long term as a result of doing that? I'll, I'll refer that one to Stuart. Oh, thanks, Mr. Brian, for the generosity in that. Um, I think that moving forward, um, PPP PFI contracts, as, as you alluded to, Councillor McDade, were over time, um, and there was financial support provided to local authorities. It was also presented as, as a way forward at a point in time. Um, these are not contracts which we would look to enter into moving forward. As you rightly say, the Council's borrowing costs are relatively low, and there is a discussion ongoing um, with Scottish Futures Trust about building uh, an appropriate model for financing um, our, our capital infrastructure moving forward. In terms of buying ourselves out of these contracts, the cost of doing that would be significant. We'd also have to factor in um, the uh, ongoing maintenance costs which are covered under these um, contracts and the assets do revert back to the council at a point in time for the school estate, which is by far the largest part of our PFI and PPP responsibilities. But uh, I'm happy to, to look at the issue. I, I can't give you an immediate response to that, but we're happy to look at the issue moving forward. What I can say is these contracts are historic and we wouldn't enter into similar contracts for our capital infrastructure in the future. I think that's helpful and uh, I'd be interested to hear uh, the outcome of your review of that in the future. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions then, thank you. Um, so the, uh, the unaudited accounts uh, have, uh, are to be submitted to the controller of audit by the 30th of June. Uh, and uh, to enable that to happen, it is recommended that Firstly, that the committee authorises the head of finance to sign the unaudited accounts. Is that agreed? Thank you. Um, and the committee is also asked to note that it, it is anticipated that the unsigned uh, audited annual accounts will be considered by the audit committee on the 18th of September. Thanks. Okay, if there are no, no further business, uh, I'd like to close the meeting. I uh, hope you enjoy recess, that's elected members only, uh, and we'll see you back here in September. Thank you.